I'm just going to record it as backup just in case something hideous and dreadful happens. Is that all right? I agree. Thank you so much. Yeah. I like that idea. Okay. Welcome to another episode of Games and Education. I am here today with uh, a great, great game designer named Ron Edwards. And Ron is the creator of many, many games, uh, starting with ones I've known called Sorcerer. Uh, another game I've played recently or have been reading about, Circle of Hands. And, well, when, we, when I first had one to have Ron on the show, I'll say, You've made a lot of games, and you can actually, you know, if you'd like to say, just say hello to the audience. <laughs> First of all, hello. I'm not sure I can live up to the great, great. I'll try for one great as best as I can. You know, for many of your games, I will say most of your games have probably a more adult theme than I would recommend to play with students, but I'm open to hear as much as you can. But there are very, very... Um, challenging and adult topics in some of them. But one of the things that you created a long time ago that, that really started so much of a genre of gaming that is so important for students is lines and veils and the topic of communication in gaming before you start a game. And by that, we mean gaming can sometimes get into really challenging topics that might be tough for people to discuss. Uh, and you've designed a system, a way to communicate about that, and it's just turned into a whole really almost important aspect of all story gaming and role-playing gaming of how to talk to each other about communication. So you are my guest today to really talk about that concept. I was exploring it as we talked about a second ago into things called the X card, which we'll talk about. Gaming table, using the gaming table as a place of great communication, and by doing this, we're going to have a discussion, learning this conversation with everybody that open conversations of what we all expect from a game, the better gaming experience we'll have. And I, I wanted to invite you here to talk about all that. And, you know, right now at the beginning, Ron, if you want to just start going on, would you like to explain why this type of thing is so important to you, why it was created and, and, and what's its purpose? I'd love to hear your origins of why we need this, which I do, we do, but your thoughts on why we need these open conversations at the beginning of game. Well, the, that's several different aspects in sort of an opening statement. I'm going to break them down. One is very briefly just to mention the pedigree. So because how, where and how I first published it does matter. It matters because I was working on the third supplement for Sorcerer, which is titled Sex and Sorcery. And it concerned a lot of the role playing that I was doing at that time in which we were discovering very counterintuitively and contrary to everything that had ever been said in my presence about role playing, we were discovering that we were capable of playing with astoundingly mature and often graphic content in a fashion that we found inspiring and fueling the story, not just sort of detouring off into being, you know, explicit, but just instead actually using this as powerful story content. And that was surprising to everybody involved. It was happening with several different groups at once. And all of us were saying, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be able to do this with role playing. Everyone says, you know, never, never let this happen. Never remember back then it's changed now for a number of reasons, but back then you weren't even supposed to refer to another player's gender. You weren't supposed to, you know, everything was supposed to be Barbie and Ken. There was nothing like that was supposed to be in role playing. It was bad. And so that's sort of the pedigree, you know, to realize experientially that we were doing something that had been very explicitly said to us for years, decades, never do. And that all the game texts out there, with extremely few exceptions, said never do. So um, that's does that help a little bit for just the where it came from in the moment and in terms of publication? It does. It helps so much. And, you know, I, I'm relating the same thing to what I've been doing with students with that. Uh, we go through, I, I use your role playing a lot in novels that they mm -hmm. research. Um, and so for instance, in 11th grade, I think it was, or 10th grade, Crucible. Right. And 
uh, in the Crucible, I mean, there's there's violence in it. There's abuse in it. There is, you know, um, adultery in the book. Mm -hmm. And play scenes around the book. And yet you're right. In their head, they were like, I, I can't do this. Can I? Am I allowed to do something like this? I want to. Are we okay? Right. And they were so uncomfortable at first that when I had the idea of that, when I brought in lines and veils, and uh, I should, I'll just start for a second, explain to the audience real quickly. Uh, could I, could we wait just a sec to define them? Because there's something yes. else I wanted to say about that. Is that okay? Yes, no, please. Okay. But nonetheless, I do want to say that when we did it, after we opened up these conversations about it, I, I swear I had a group. It was amazing. There was a group that was trying to do the crucible and they were showing how, uh, it's horribly shunned. And actually, I think this was the Scarlet Letter. We changed right. it into a crucible. We did the Scarlet Letter. Um, and in the Scarlet Letter, there is, I forget the main character's name, but she is being, you know, abused by everybody. So at one point, we look over to the class and they're LARPing it. And they're throwing books at her and they're throwing pencils at her and they're throwing erasers at her. And she's crying in the corner. And we all kind of freak out and go, are you guys okay? Is everything oh, no. okay? Intervention, intervention. The and they're like, no, get away from us. We're doing fine. <laughs> exactly what happened. The girl says, no, 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 I'm okay. Please keep going. Let them go. And she was cathartic about it and oh, loved yeah. it. Being the one yeah. thrown at. And if it, and you know, I, the class before they were so uncomfortable doing these things because I forgot to do lines and veils. Right. That time. Okay. Well, geez, and you, and you, you did it, a little lab experiment for everybody right there inadvertently. Had it, they were so more open about it. They were able yeah. to do things because they had permission. Let's stick with that, that a little a bit. Opening, but... Yeah. Let's stick with that permission idea a little bit because it, what we found that I was talking about uh, in my play experience was that we had given each other permission without realizing it. And so, um, and so let's carry on what the concept really is about is much bigger than just this business of boundaries. What's bigger is to recognize that the fiction of role playing and its subroutines of system of mechanics, those are actually not an enclosed unit. They're actually inside. They're a part of a bigger thing going on, which is the people, the real people. And the real people are of a particular species, and we are of particular constructions and individual constructions and individual histories and social needs and social priorities. And frankly, there's no controlling that. It is what it is. When you get together with a group of people, it is what it is. And you can refine it or make it better or, you know, shape help shape it, you know, in many ways at that point. But it is what it is with those people doing this thing at this time. And so everything else about role playing, what we imagine and how we roll dice, if we do that or whatever we do, is all going to live or die on the basis of how it functions as a piece of this socializing. This was anathema when I said this back between 2000 and 2003. This was the, I was, the, the, the pushback in all of the venues about role playing was extraordinarily strong. It was, you see, up until then, what you said was you're talking about the rules or something, and then and and you uh, are talking about how they work, and then someone says, "Oh, but what you just said, that's social. That's not system." So social was over here in its own shoebox, and system and the implied fiction that it created. Um, we're over in a completely different shoebox and you were supposed to just put all the social into the one shoebox and shove it away and say that stuff doesn't belong in gaming. We're just going to stay in this shoebox. And I'm saying, no, sorry, man, you, this one is always inside that one. It always will be. It will always be. My audience be. here who is not necessarily. Yeah. You explain what you mean. By the social shoebox. What does social mean different than the right. system? Just Quite a bit. I have a lot. They, right. We have educators in here. So uh, <laughs> have, have maybe. <laughs> Well, let me put it this way. If we, uh, I, I have a, a, a fairly brutal definition of the word social. So what it means is a group of people engaged in this case, let's stick with leisure group activities. So, you know, it's not abstract at all. To think of a group of people or some people in a social, sorry, uh -huh, a, a shared leisure activity. They're doing it together. Um, in that circumstance, the people themselves are going to have priorities and interests that are status based. They are perhaps sexual or romantic based. 
they are based on any other kind of physiology, somebody's hungry, uh, they are much more sophisticated than those things in terms of social relationships and histories. These two people are siblings, whereas everyone else is not. These two people are, you know, we, you had a, a, a tough time in their friendship five years ago and are now very reconciled. These other two people hardly know each other and are not sure if they like each other. Am I describing, I, I could go on, but do you get the idea of what I mean by social? The best word is social you, dynamics. Does that help? Yes, it does. So when a group okay. gets together and every single person on this podcast before has also talked about it because they've right. all said that really while gaming is a creative thing, it's actually mainly about the collaboration between people. Uh, when you're saying when we get people together, even though we're asking them to play characters and play other things, we have to do realize and acknowledge that everybody there is themselves have experiences and life that they are bringing to this thing outside of just what they are supposed to be playing as characters. Correct. And now I will explain the shoeboxes. If you say that those distinctions that you just did are equal partners, I'm saying, no, they're not. I'm not saying that those are two definite categories, how we make the fiction with the system over here and how we socialize as human beings over there and that you can pick and choose which one you're going to do today. I'm saying that if you're going to do this collaborative and systemic activity, and that goes for playing a game of cards, just like for role playing, it goes for making a quilt together, just like role playing, it goes for cleaning a kitchen together, just like role playing, um, anything that has its routines, tasks, you know, outcomes and stuff like that with that group of people, it's going to be inside the social dynamics. The social dynamics will inform why and how you use certain pieces, how why and how you use certain pieces will come back and have a bigger and have an impact up the line, if you will, to the outer box of how we get along or how we don't get along or why. And so all yeah. of these things, it's a that the relationship, that hierarchical relationship or nested relationship is crucial to my point. I when I try to run games at the classroom, uh one of the things we always talk about is you talk about hierarchical relationships, and I always love Maslow's hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, you're right. The most important thing first is that these are people together, regardless of anything else. We have to know how they are going. We have to understand how people react to each other right. just by everything going on. You can't say, is, oh, you know, we're playing say a role-playing right, game. That, that doesn't count today. That does, It's not going to work. Um. So great. The so with that stated, I I talked in the book. I I was struggling with with ways to teach it in uh, sex and sorcery. Back then, I talked about you know when you're really paying attention to the fiction, and that includes the mechanics of making it. Um, then you can kind of think of yourself as as under the water, you know. And then you can say, well, on the other hand, you can kind of pull yourself up and leave your feet in the water while you sit on the side of the pool and think about what it is you're doing with everybody else, you know, who's in there with you. And so, you know, I don't know if that analogy really works. Some people had trouble with it. But the, the thing I'm doing now is to say that when it comes to lines and veils, we have to break it apart. And I think this, I'm very interested in your thoughts on this. One is whether we do it at all because we're really talking about techniques during play. The other question is about whether we talk about it first, which would be part of the technique if we do it. So those are actually two different things. And I'd like to talk about what happens in play. If we look at a group and we say, oh yeah, they, they use lines and veils. What do we see them doing? And what... Uh, I mean, and, and of course it can be very subtle, so it, it may not be all that easy to spot, but the idea being that do we see our people observing boundaries of certain kinds and do we also see people, and I'm talking about the fictional content now, um, and do we also see people um, opening, kind of, kind of discovering where the boundaries are? in in play uh so that's one thing to understand is that that you can talk and talk and talk before you play all you want to but what really matters is what happens in play so does so that at that point yeah. 
It does. At mm-hmm. that point, can I give a brief definition or, or you're yeah, welcome now's to the perfect what line in advance? I think we totally are ready for the definitions. Yeah. So, and back me up because you are, I, do you <laughs> want to explain it? You are. The no, <laughs> no, no. I, I'm, I would love to, to understand how the understanding, <laughs> I'd love to see what condition my condition is in, if that makes any sense. Uh, I love that. So here I yeah. go. Um, how I've interpreted lines and veils is at the beginning, because as you said, all of these social aspects that come into a game, uh, we need to have boundaries set of what we want to talk about, how we want to act, what we want to look like and feel like in a game. So of it to actually enjoy each other's company playing and a line is in a game is we're not going to bring up this subject in a game or this idea in a game. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to play this way. Imagery certainly counts too. Yeah. Imagery certainly counts too. Uh, So for example, as I always say in, if we were doing the Scarlet Letter, the book, there are, there is clearly abuse. There is things like um, adultery and People are uncomfortable talking about that. They say, I want to draw a line at adultery. I don't want to talk about the subject. I'd rather play just with these parts about her being persecuted and ostracized. And let's leave the adultery out of it. I don't want to talk about that. And then that means that everybody agrees that because that one person doesn't want to talk about it, we are not going to bring that up in order for everyone to have a good time. Because the second if we did bring it up, they would not enjoy the game. And so we, the most important thing is enjoying the game. So we're going to draw a line there. And I always say a line means we're not going to talk about it. It's not coming up. Yeah. It's not in, it's not in our fiction. That's just not going to be there. Yeah. Okay. And then a veil, as I always say, it's, it's the fade to black. Right. We're, we're ready to talk about it. We're willing to bring it in there, but it's always going to be on the side. As I always say, that is the difference between R and PG-13 or PG-13 and PG. And the way I give a great example is a big thing people like to veil sometimes is violence. Mm-hmm. And if you were in a rated R game or something really violent, you'd be shooting people, blasting people, really hurting people. But you could then do the PG version, which is if you watch a PG movie, someone gets hit by a blaster, it's off screen, there's right. no blood, there's no nothing. And right. that's fine, too. It depends on how people are comfortable with the topic of violence. Or a big one I use with students all the time is sex and things, especially because, yes, you're talking about high school. And in high school, you're like, we shouldn't talk about sex much in high school. But yet they read The Great Gatsby and The Great Gatsby has a bunch of adult things like that. So we say, you know, we'll veil that. So. And that's it veil. But we know what happened afterwards. Right. right. Um, so that's a fade to black and a veil. And in the way now these are lines and veils, the way I use it is we talk about these before the game starts. We say this is the first thing. These are what we want to go over so your group knows how everyone can have a good time by having these lines and veils. And if someone says something that they want feeling comfortable with, you all have to agree that we're not going to talk about that because if even one person is not enjoying it, really bad, you would leave someone out and it would not make for a good experience. So it's a communication before the game starts of everybody's expectations of what the game will be so that everyone has a good time. And those are what I define as line and veil. Does that work for you? Is that Well, you actually made a really, really strong topic shift in the middle of that, which was to talk about what they are during play and then talking about the conversation before play. And what I was driving at before is let's stick with them in play just for a little bit before we address the issue of the conversation beforehand. Um, in terms of, Address that. yeah, explain. Yeah. The, the idea being this, that, um, with a line, um, the, the point is not necessarily that we discussed it beforehand. The point is that it, that however you come upon the line, that the person who's about to cross it or has inadvertently stepped over it, perhaps, will dial it back. That that somebody says, uh, you know, that that you have crossed a line, for example, in play. Uh, perhaps you discussed it beforehand. Perhaps you did not. But in the heat of play, and then whoever sort of recognizes this goes, oh wait a sec, 
And then the question is whether the person who'd gone there actually is okay with going, oh, line, okay, and then we're out of there. You know, if you got to retcon a little, fine. If you're just stopping right there, fine, whatever it takes. But you see, you could that's what I was saying before. You could talk and talk and talk for hours before play. But if people don't do that when they bump into a line, then it's all for naught. So that's the first thing is to say we're talking about the observance of lines in play. Another good example would be observance, say we did talk about beforehand or for any other reason, we've got a good intuitive feel of them and people just stay, you know, inside the lines. Um, and you may, you might not notice that they're doing it, but then if you, you know, really knew the group and knew other things they played to go, oh, wow, this time they really stayed inside certain lines. So, but the point is that they do. So that's uh, the observance to me is critical because often that involve it's it's kind of what i'm worried about is the notion that if you cross a line you blew it you sinned the person's miserable play is broken you've ruined it you shouldn't you should have known the line buddy now we all have to go home and that's not true the whole point of observing a line is to say oh well having encountered it we can you know not continue we can stop or we can dial it back and say, okay, well, that's not going to be happening. Okay, all right, good enough, you know. Um, and so does that make, that, that the same thing goes for veils, that if somebody were to begin describing uh, elements that, you know, others find that they would need veiled or somebody, or even that person themselves, that's another thing. People cross their own lines and veils all the time by accident. And they might say, oh, wait, I better, I know, I, I thinking about this all of a sudden, Let's veil this one. Or they, they just switch to a kind of description, which is a fade to black. And you that's what I mean there. We have to, if we're going to talk about lines and veils, we have to think about people actually doing them in the edge cases. So, and to recognize that a certain amount of readjustment is socially and creatively uh, okay. So it's not like these, uh, you know, these these dreadful play breaking moments of, you know, you've 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 blown it for everybody now. Um, so that's what brings me then to want to talk. I mean, first of all, does that unpack that a little bit? Why I'm so insistent on that aspect of things before we talk about the pre play discussion? No, absolutely. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, you okay. are 100 percent right, Ron. And I want the audience to know that. This is something we should always do when we use lines and veils. They should not be talked in the beginning. That's a good place to start, and we'll get into their why. Right. But yes, absolutely. I think one of the most important aspects of gaming is to let them know that if any time you're feeling uncomfortable, say the word line, we're just done, yeah. or veil, we're going to hide it, but we want to keep understanding it because as play changes, and you're right, I love people do cross their own lines all mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. and I've even seen it in classes. We'll talk about that in a minute, very, yeah. Mm -hmm. when they do to understand that they the, the consent of the table is everyone needs to have a good time mm -hmm. so if you cross somebody's line you got it they got to one be able they hopefully can communicate it and they also need to let everyone know everyone else has to have the understanding that that's okay we crossed it we're sorry we're going to stop now right because yeah i mean it's, it's kind of yeah go ahead sorry anything is to have a great experience for everybody in gaming and the only way to do that is to respect everybody and uh I, you're 100 right in the action in the moment it should be there that's why i really also love and i want to introduce soon x cards um in a in a moment uh where there, there's there's plan i'm sorry to keep pacing you on these things but really it's there's there's nuances to everything we're saying that i think will benefit if we keep this kind of slow um thank you so much yeah, please the, keep going with it slow okay the uh, um, so yes mm -hmm. so the the first concept being that we have to talk about what's being observed and done in play and to really stress the idea that r when you talk about respecting li others lines i think and also the idea well people need to be ready to speak up or I think it has a little bit to do with saying it can be a little gentler than that. The idea being that I like the fact that we're going to, you know, observe certain lines and I'm, I'm, I'm invested in doing it. 
And even if I cross it, it's not as though I have to be dragged screaming and kicking back over it. I, you know, are confronted, you know, and shamed. You crossed that line, you know. No, I want, I don't want to cross the line, you know. I'll, or, or at least, you know, I'm willing to, I'm, I'm all about, let's, let's back it up a bit. Um, so that's one thing. Let's get kind of a positive reinforcing notion going on rather than a notion of people sitting there kind of in defensive crouches for when they each other crosses lines. Um, that, that kind of fearful, oh, oh, he better not cross my line kind of play, you know, is not trusting people about that is, is a problem. Um, so, uh, with that said, let's go to talk about the conversation beforehand and the, uh, the, the fact that I'm actually, I mean, I know it's really, really worked well for you in the classroom. And I think it is important and it can be extremely constructive. But there's a down, there's a dark side to the pre-play conversation about lines and veils. And it's a bad dark side. It's a really, it's a toxic one, in my opinion, which is to have effectively a tedious encounter group session where people sort of get almost drunk on the control on the authority that they are feeling they're granted in to tell other people what to do and to instead of actually investigating their own lines and veils are instead being more like directors for the kind of story that they want to enforce everybody else to make um or perhaps to some perceived third party audience that doesn't really exist um so the the point is, I'm talking about inauthentic discussion. I'm talking about um, posturing or pious, um, scoldy discussion or a person, to be really negative about it, sadly, this is rare, but it does occur, a person who, you know, basically becomes so tender and so vulnerable that, you know, they're, they're happily, it's like, oh, everybody, I just thought of another line. Everybody, I just thought of another veil here. And by now the list is like, you know, looks like this whiteboard covered with, you know, things. Um, that kind of discussion is extremely, extremely counterproductive. Um, and even if play does proceed from there, because that can kill play, first of all. Second, if it does proceed from there, everybody is in that defensive crouch and everybody is in that state of, well, now that we've discussed it so thoroughly, you know, God help me if I, you know, accidentally even look toward that line thing that they talked about. Um, and so that is the tendency. I, I doubt you've encountered that with the classroom. You must be handling it in a really good way and perhaps something about the creative state and the commitment state of your classroom environment, you know, it keeps that from happening or helps, you know, avoid that. Maybe, maybe it's not something that teens are, are prone to. Maybe it's something that older people are more prone to. Um, but that's the first thing. So I want to talk about doing a slightly riskier version than what you're describing to emphasize that it too is functional. And it too is, in my own experience, playing with older people mostly, is perhaps more functional than the long pre-play discussion, which is to find the lines by brushing them. And it means you play a little easy, a little lightly, really willing to say, I don't know what's kind of going too far for you, but we all are with each other and when we get there, you're going to let me know, or I'll get the idea just because I'm being sensitive to the people around me. Um, and so the, the benefit of doing it this way is that you find the real lines, not the, not the lines people want other people to believe they have, but the lines that they really have. And uh, Meg Baker calls playing like this, it's called, I will not abandon you. The idea being that if I cross over a line, you might kind of swallow hard and go anyway and not respond as a line because sometimes stories are very troubling. And you say, you know what? He's hitting something that he or she is hitting something for me. I, you know what? I think with these people and the way we're doing this, I'm brave enough. Maybe that's not the right word. I am today okay 
with doing this a bit more. Maybe my real line is two more steps in. And um, that's what I have found to be extremely powerful uh, is to find the lines a little bit more by Braille rather than a verbal discussion. Um, perhaps a discussion beforehand to say that we're going to do this in, you know, that's what we're going to do is, is sometimes very helpful. Um, this is more important for lines than it is for veils because veiling is really easy by comparison, isn't it? I mean, veiling's the, veiling's the easy option, um, or the, the easy technique. Lines are a much more difficult technique. Um, but does that make sense that, that I'm, that's why I wanted to emphasize their observance in play particularly the idea that if you bump into one, no blood, no foul, we'll just not do it. And if you have that, then the pre-play discussion becomes an option rather than a, def a part of the definition. And maybe in many cases, it's the right option. In many and maybe ca many cases, it might not be the right option. Does that make any sense, Keenan? Actually beautiful. And I actually thank you for giving me another, another topic on next week oh. and it's we're going to talk about games and education in teens and uh i want to bring up i will not abandon you because i right. love that idea well it's, so, it's yes, got I, a partner you know that right um the, there's meg baker when i introduced lines and veils and everybody was debating and debating and i'm like drafting sex and sorcery and and uh uh you know play testing the scenario that's in there um, and, and everybody's talking about explicit this and that in their games. The Forge was a very, very, very fleshy place in 2002. Everybody was playing games with everybody, you know, doing this and that in the game. It's so like, we had this great time playing and this happened during play. That's impossible, you know? So that's going on. But the other thing, the other version, the alternative that Meg talked about was called No One Gets Hurt. No One Gets Hurt is playing very, very far within the lines. And in many ways predicates knowing them beforehand in a fairly explicit way. And also you just don't go near any of them. You're saying this ain't in the fiction and we know it and we're not going near it. This person, that person, the other person, they don't like it. And we're not going near it a bit. That's called no one gets hurt. Whereas I will not abandon you is about being willing when you encounter your own line, or I mean, or rather play encounters one of your lines to say, well, if, if I were sitting in an interview and somebody asked me what I would not tolerate in a story, this is what I would say. But here I am in this story and I am into this story after all. And I don't think anybody here is after me or trying to get me with this. And maybe actually my own distaste is actually a source of power for what characters will do and say in this scene. Maybe my response right now is actually could be an engine for what's going to happen with this stuff in the fiction. A little bit, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to go too far with this, but I could go a little bit further than where I am right now. And the, so the difference between no one gets hurt and I will not abandon you is fascinating. People who were very committed to one or the other found the description of the other appalling. People who were used to playing no one gets hurt and thought of that as kind of their high ethical standpoint of the most developed and functional play they'd ever encountered. When someone else tried to explain, I will not abandon to you to them, they were like, that's, that's terrible. That's everybody triggering each other. That's everybody, you know messing with each other i mean that's disgusting you're throwing they, they got it mixed up with veils you know you're having all this explicit stuff you know and no people don't want it and so you know you're so they had this reaction and it goes the other way too people who had discovered i will not abandon you and i modestly say that a few of my early games kind of you know led some people to find that they enjoyed playing like that um th then when they heard about no one gets hurt they were kind of like what you know what a bunch of cream puffs you know don't you don't you ever watch a movie that disturbs you don't you ever watch don't you think some works of literature i mean you're all fans of samurai movies here and there's a rape camp in seven samurai thank you very much you know um the the, the what you're, you're gonna play without you're gonna play the seven samurai without that even in there that's half the subplots 
And so, um, you know, the the thing I'm getting at is that the two, the first of all, there were people who had no idea what we were talking about with these social issues in the first place, but never mind that. When we were talking about people who had really put effort into developing functional play without the terminology of lines and veils, but upon seeing the terminology said, yes, that's what we do. And then they tried to talk about what it was for. And we quickly discovered, Meg Baker, as I said, was the person who quickly discovered that there were clearly two incompatible value systems that could obtain during play about them. So I agree what, so I agree yeah. so much with everything you were saying. About oh my goodness. <laughs> really? <laughs> Well, yeah. Uh, so when I do with students, it's actually so interesting because we hear from a different end with students and I'll just get into that in a second. Yeah, yeah I'd love to. But know. we really do and we emphasize with students uh, throughout this entire process is we we just want to have everybody have a good time. Mm -hmm. If they're not having a good time, that's really the end. You know, that's the end of this. Activity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And nobody and question so nobody questions that in many other social activities. You know, there is such a thing as walking away from other social leisure activities when you don't like it. With role playing, for some reason, a lot of people have a little trouble owning their uncomfortableness or their unhappiness and just saying, OK, hey, guys, I'm unhappy or, or you know what? Never mind talking to you. I'm unhappy here. I'm done. But sorry, go ahead. I went off on a ramble there. Go ahead. Sorry, Keenan. But so much with students. Uh, I, I always start my lines of mail conversation and I'll go, I'll, I'll jump back a little bit because I, well, I do encourage it, what you say through the middle and love the idea of doing it at the, at this sort of, I will not abandon you. If you feel comfortable, go farther. Don't, these are not hard and fast. I actually use it as a reverse in the beginning mm -hmm. because already, since it's a classroom, there are already lines and veils that everybody believes. And some of these people, don't forget, these are students when I'm trying to run it with an entire class that have never role played before I'm, at all. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on this. So they don't know anything and they're stuck in a classroom, in a literature classroom. And imagine being, I mean, these are a bunch right. of 10th graders. Yeah, this is, and they're it is not entirely elective on their part after all. No, not only is it not elective, a lot of them actually want to do it still. Let's go into right. that. A lot actually really yeah. want to do it, but they've never done it. They don't know how, and they're doing it inside the classroom. And so That's we cool. do these microscopish type scenes where it's just a scene. There's no dice rolling, no nothing like that. But we're doing it in, let's say, the book, The Great Gatsby, mm -hmm. which has especially a few topics in there. It has sexually explicit topics. It has definitely gender topics that could be uncomfortable because the women are treated way poorly compared to the men mm -hmm. um and they need they want to role play this out but they look but then they go i can't act that way i would be it's insane to act this way especially in a classroom right and teacher you say to everybody all right there are a few absolute lines and veils because we're in a classroom right. there are lines we're not going to do here you guys are in 10th grade we don't want to get in trouble mm -hmm. you know but well you know that they yeah. Other than that, uh, as a teacher, we don't want to get in trouble. Like, no, I completely we, hear you. Yeah. Say to the students, we say, but you know what? You're willing to maybe go a little farther than that. And if you, mm -hmm. the, we, I actually say lines of I say, you know, if there are a few things, let's talk about these lines. There are things that we all just don't want to talk about. And I actually say, like, I give examples of where those would be in the topic of what they're reading. Right. So, right. If it's yeah, Romeo yeah. and Juliet we're reading and we're doing scenes of Romeo and Juliet, let's talk about lines that probably would be in this. What would they be? Well, there would be like sex. Yes, sex could be a line that happens in Romeo and Juliet. Or violence. There's duels everywhere. What do you want to see about it? I said, like, do you want to Yeah, that's to a veil issue because the, 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 the duels happen. So it's just a question of, you know, what we see happening. Exactly. Yeah. Veils too. I do both. And yeah, I'm just yeah. using it like that. Sorry. But yeah, both idea and unless the lines and veils we talk about there. And then I say, or go more comfortable. You can be like, we're ready for anything and we'll reach you when we come. Right. And I literally say that to yeah. them. I'm like, or yeah. you could be like, we're going to go for it and right. see what happens. Right. And, and just being willing to say that sooner or later, when somebody does say, Ooh, line, I think, I think I hit the real one, <laughs> you know, real line. <laughs> then that's you, yeah. the, that's why I was saying the observance of it, we're going to take as given in order to have this discussion about the prep. Um, that's, that prep is at the beginning. Yeah. 
the the students I'll, you'll see some groups and they go like oh man we can do anything no lines and they all are like looking super excited to be like no lines no veils right. let's go there right and at well, some point that if they do encounter one yeah. they can they can stop it absolutely but that gives them yeah. permission mm -hmm. it gives them permission right there to say you're telling me in my classroom mm -hmm. i can and i mean like i had this one i swear this one game of great gatsby the videos were almost like and share some of the videos publicly because it was just so crazy what these students were doing right but right there they are in great gatsby and they're they're yelling at each other screaming at one point they're shooting a guy to just right. show how powerful they are yeah and there and they loved it because they all agreed like no it's cool we're here we can do it now right. we all said to each other we have talked to each other and communicated right. that that we want to try to do this and hey is anybody uncomfortable if no one is not we're gonna do it and it, I, so it's exactly that way of that I will not abandon you. We'll go there. Right. What I love in the beginning is I, if I don't, I find it the opposite reverse is if I don't talk to them about it at all in the beginning, especially for new role players, right. they all kind of just sit there being as just as they can yes. because it's a classroom. Yeah, they, there's suddenly the, the whole decorum, the, the whole decorum of that, the somewhat artificial good student, you know, teacher authority thing kicks in. Um, my, my thing with some of this is interesting in terms of people's responses at the table. Um, one is that in some kinds of play, when so, there's, a, there's what I like to think of as the good wince or the good shudder and the bad, the bad ones. You know, the, the, the good wince, the good shudder, and they're very not, they're not ironic. They are really, you know, a wince or, or you know, the person kind of, you know, is taken aback um but on the other hand the way that they then look at the person who is speaking is very much a wow that i'm i'm really affected by this it would be up to somebody who i think has a better terminology for human social dynamic interaction um to describe how you recognize when such a reaction says excellent and when such a reaction says too far, because the the precise response is fairly similar. So in terms of the person's expression and stuff like that, but I do think that there is such a thing as a shudder that is confirmatory of the power of what we're doing and confirmatory of the value, if you want to put it that way, in aesthetic in experiential terms. As an aside, do you know my professional background? Fair to share. Oh yeah, yeah, of course. I just didn't know if I was just going to be blathering away at something you already knew. I was uh, in academia for 25 years. I was uh, a, a biology professor for 15 years. Um, and so, uh, and I had a very broad curriculum, uh, much of which involved humans and human stuff and human activities as well as you know mitochondria and all that good stuff too your discussion of the classroom environment although it's a little different in universities and high school when you talk about like the dynamics that they might shift into when they don't have permission to go somewhere i really understand what you're talking about i know what you mean um so anyway yes i to go back to the I'm student glad. yeah to go back to the student who was having that response um and, and you were thinking, oh, that's a bad reaction. You know, that's a bad response. And she said, no, no, it's not. And what's, you know, in, in, in a less LARPy situation and perhaps a less dramatic, tearful kind of situation, it is interesting to think about when I have been playing, particularly, and I'll give a good example, when we're playing and there's a lot of people there, we don't know each other necessarily very well. Some of us don't. And there is sort of a, a look when somebody goes, whoa, you know, or, or, you know, kind of doesn't even say because saying in some ways is, is communicative. A person responds in a way that's not really communicative is just, you know, sort of a, a wince or a blink or a face aversion or something like that. And, you know, if I, you know, make eye contact and stop talking, I mean, I, I show that I can stop. And then, interestingly enough, the person might give me kind of a look, they acknowledge that, and then they give kind of a quirk grin, kind of a quirky grin, which is like, 
I am into this, you know, don't, you know, whatever. Or then they start talking and pick up what we were, what we were doing. So what I'm saying is that it would be really interesting for people to investigate precise the micro perceptions and micro interactions of this but that person will have to be being paid and will probably not be me so i'll just leave it as a question um and definitely i do think that's part of it as we and the teacher we just love to make sure they're okay so it is know, funny know, like you know, know after that scene we just said okay go back to it and it was hilarious because right after they started going right back to it and the whole class started watching it was such a good oh, yeah. scene and it was like this great thing and it was just like we had to you know i do agree with you the importance of the stop to show we care right and after we know we care if everything is good just keep going right it's a really um, interesting it's dynamic that i want to focus on in contrast in my opinion and i am open to counter argument on this but it seems to me as though the x card is a very blunt and limited instrument toward the ends that we are talking about. You know, I'll explain what the X card is, and yeah. I actually kind of do agree with you. Mm -hmm. That's why I haven't done it. And if uh -huh. that is your opinion, I might just not. I might listen well, to it. Well, well to, to give the definition so we make sense to anybody, I hope audience and things like that when we've talked about lines and veils and if you've been to my trainings i've talked about it you can look at my videos about it um there is also a thing in these gaming systems called an x card x card is a card you hold up that says okay we've gone too far and they hold up a card and that says i'm uncomfortable um and that lets everybody know okay we pause for a second let's talk about it let's see can we as you've said retcon can we go backwards can we make it better for you because we want a great experience for everybody and it's a physical symbol that you hold up that everybody agrees upon that when this symbol is up we kind of pause for a moment or we back it up we understand there's something so someone doesn't have to verbally say kind of those words and right. get embarrassed a little bit of right i'm that, uncomfortable right. i completely it. agree that if the alternative is to speak up and frankly shut someone down right when they're talking or contributing um and so if it's the choice between what some people will perceive either as target or as delivery as confrontation that it may be psychologically and socially easier simply to get that card up instead and the fact that it's sitting on the table that's the theory behind it and also i'll give the background this is not part of what anything i published this came much much later and is typically credited to john stavropoulos um, and has kind of entered a lot of game texts since then so that, you know, the game text will have a little explanation of the X card in it. The, the reason I tend to think of it as perhaps imprecise and um, overly limited. You see, the trouble is I'm so nice. Now I keep thinking of it. I'm, I'm, I keep massaging it into the positive version of itself. So it's hard to criticize the positive version of it. Let me, let me collect my thoughts a little bit. Well, first of all, I actually find it to be more confrontational than the dynamics that I was describing. Um, I find it to be uh, a power issue. And one of the most important things about functional lines and veils in action is that it's not a power issue. There's nobody is saying, I have more power than you while you're speaking, so I get to shut you down. Um, the, you know, it's kind of like the, the, uh, the question of the, the gavel, you know, somebody has a gavel they can bang and the use of the X card to me resembles that more than it resembles the, uh, the, the, the kind of, I mean, just using, I, I find the use of the word line and veil because they require no explanation. The person doesn't have to justify them. Um, that accounts for the same value that I think people are perceiving in the X card already. Um, and, and that no, it, it, I, I would, that's one thing. The the other well, thing, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Keenan. There's one other thing that which is that the X card is very suited. I think it's uniquely suited to no one gets hurt, and it is very poorly suited to. I will not abandon you because if you're playing, I will, well, 
it, it would convert an attempt or an enjoyment of I will not abandon you into no one gets hurt. And for people who kind of want to play I will not abandon you, that means that they they find play to be rather bloodless. They find it, you know, that, that they're in a rating. They, they, they would prefer to be in a higher rating. Thank you very much. And so, um, and I, but that, that's misleading because that's more about veils. I'm thinking more about lines. So does that make sense? I think that it's blunt because it's more confrontational and more prone to power trip applications. And I also think that it's imprecise. Uh, oh, no, sorry. It's, it's, it's limited. Blunt and imprecise were the same thing. It's limited because instead of looking at the whole applications of the whole range of applications of lines and veils, it is very much a no one gets hurt application. So does that make sense so I, about that? I actually agree with you 100%. Wow. Uh, one of the things that's very important is, well, so we talk with students and if we talk about a thing called the four C's in school, creativity, collaboration, communication, uh, collaboration communication yeah, it's like the seven dwarfs I'm, I'm waiting for the fourth yeah i know uh and we'll talk about those three right now because those are three of the right. games oh cr uh critical thinking that's Excellent. the fourth one but when we talk about those we really want to encourage students to be collaborative and communicative oh yeah and i actually think that one of the reasons we do games all the time and we should do games inside a classroom is it truly opens up a new form of communication it gets us to have dialogues in ways we might not have had and helps us in those situations. It's like why people say, and I agree, that role-playing games can help you in different aspects of your life is when you're older, when you play as a teen, because it, it, it prepares you for situations in ways. Can um, I can I uh, throw a throw a, uh, a sub a footnote onto that? What you just said. Can I go on? Go on. Okay. Go on. Yeah. The the on, footnote is that one of the key elements of much of role playing is that you are often presented with things that are not of your making or if the situations and things are of your making that they will have outcomes that are not and uh Paul Sega the author of My Life with Master and the Clay that Woke is the person I credit with articulating this best the idea that it's no fun to make up your own and resolve your own conflict, one or the other. But the other one is somewhat challenging. It is somewhat, you know, either someone present, you are being presented with a situation which is in and of itself challenging to address and you didn't make it up, or you are in a situation that is perhaps intrinsic to the character that you made up, or you perhaps framed the conflict for your own character in particular games, but the way that it is going to turn out cannot be under your control. It's going to have elements that are not controllable by you. And so that element inside that, you know, when you talk about game, the word is a terrible word with all of its weird definitions and half definitions. But in this case, that's what it means. It means that there are crisscrossing vectors of unknown and uncontrolled, at least as far as you're concerned, per situation. So does that and make sense? And that's one of the things I really want to... Yeah. It does. And that's one of the things I really want with students and why we do this is I, I teach them. I say, even in some cases, I have students that very are uncomfortable with role playing. So I let them just, you know, even in a classroom, if they're very uncomfortable with this, I want you to do your own fan fiction stories and write your own stories. But I say one of the most important parts about going in this is if you read a good book, drama happens to the character. Bad things happen. <laughs> I was going to say, nobody, say like, nobody wants to be the hero of their own story, man. Nobody. <laughs> but I said, like, you know, just imagine so bad. Yeah. So bad things happen. And that's good. That makes for a better right. story. And I say that's why we want other people because it's very hard for us as individuals to make bad things happen for our characters. And even um, if we do, then we want the way that, that it turns out to be uncontrolled because, you know, it's no fun to say, well, this terrible thing happens and then I do this. So now it's over, you know, um, the, uh, there are a couple, that's a, a really good point. Another really interesting aspect of that. And I don't want to dwell on this 
subtopic way too much. Another really interesting aspect about this is how it relates to the enjoyment of fiction, which is kind of what you were getting at with, with the protagonists and or the, the characters and stories. Um, the notion that we invest in situations that we can't that that we don't i mean we don't control when you sit down just to take a more simple example you sit down you play cards with someone you can't control what card that person is going to play next you just can't when they play it you know the phrase read them and weep right and the idea is you came to play cards because that's in there that's not the bad part of playing cards you don't want an X card that says, oh, you can't play that because I would feel bad because I would lose this hand. And so if we analogize that to the making of fiction, it's very interesting lines used in that sense of you can't do that because I would lose advantage. I would lose, you know, in other words, there's, there's, there's an inauthentic and power strippy and statusy thing going on there. Um, which is okay in a card game because, you know, you have that, that's part of the fun is having that in a, sort of a mild fashion. But in, um, in role-playing, one says, okay, yeah, that's a good point. Are we talking about smoothing the way? Are we talking about everybody agreeing on everything as a piece of play at an atomic level? And the answer is no. That's called consensual storytelling. And if there's one thing we know, consensual storytelling, unconstructed, we're just going to do it. And we're just going to, you know, moment by moment as we play, we'll work our way through the chronology of this story with the characters. And we'll just make sure we agree as a group on every single thing as we proceed. And I assume I'm not stepping on the toes of all those lit profs out there at the moment when I say that stinks. Not only is it not fun to do, it doesn't make any kind of story that anyone ever cared about. And that's why with students, when I actually want to get to the beginning of this, going back to why I actually agree with your way more than the X card way mm -hmm. is I love your thought on its communication. Mm -hmm. If if students, if one of the things you're trying to teach students, especially at a young age, is how to communicate themselves effectively. <laughs> at all, yeah. What a, at, what a great training an RPG is with this to ha play with lines and veils and to encounter those moments and to be able to verbalize in some way, you know, this is making me uncomfortable. Could we change it in a way? Because if they could practice that at a young age, I think that's going to be such a great skill for students as they grow older. Well, certainly, much certainly knowing and knowing and, and reinforcing your boundaries is extremely important. And I would never suggest otherwise, because what I'm about to say can be misconstrued as, as uh, saying otherwise. There's the uh, there's the discovering your boundaries and the enforcing, if you want to put it that way, your boundaries, you know, making sure that other people are, you know, you're not going to just let people wander over them. And that's definitely a great thing. There's also the interesting notion because boundaries among people and particularly adults are notably flexible. Um, and we can say that's a wonderful thing about the flexibility of human behavior or other creatures' behaviors, or we can say, isn't it dreadful that we can't all be, you know, living off of our little three by five moral card all our lives. Um, but people do, you know, cheat romantically. People do have lapses of different kinds and people do, uh, you know, do transgressive art all the time. Um, and the interesting question is when it's not perceived as a lapse or a sin or a flaw, but a person goes, you know what? Yeah, this particular form of line crossing for someone, perhaps even for me, I think I actually am going to kind of embrace that as part of my personality. And there are certain things for your information that I would consider despicable for somebody to say that about. And then there are other things when I say, you know what? you be you. I'm not sure I would do that, but you be you. And having had my own, you know, adult life, I can look back and say, wow, there are some things that I have embraced as part of my personality, as part of my interaction with others, where, yeah, I kind of would 
cross that line if it seemed like that person were inclined similarly. I know I'll, I'll just keep my my little, you know, unspoken, unacknowledged, never to be admitted social antenna up insofar as I run into that person one day or another person of that ilk yes. one day. You see, people don't like to talk about this. People don't like to talk about we we would love it if we were all these moral people with high standards and, you know, only the bad people broke them. That's the other thing that bothers me about the X card. There is something, that's why I call it pious. There is something quite puritanic about it. Um, and uh, in, at least in some applications or the way that I find it explained. And the, the one of the nice things about this, and this, I don't, I'm sure nothing of what I'm saying is really anything you want to get into with teens and students. I'm talking about, all right, let's get stinky. Let's talk about what it's like when we play and we are comfortable with each other and we are playing you know, a game in which the fiction is fairly, you know, fairly intense, fairly and intrinsically fairly intensive. And you mentioned my games tend to go that way. Many of them do. And That's, the question can then I actually is... say something here? Yeah, sorry. Go uh, ahead, Keenan. Yeah. Uh, we, I found it actually did happen with the teens and it came to the greatest conversations. Uh -huh. So... All right. Well, fantastic. For example, it was... For teaching is alive. The Great Gatsby. Mm -hmm. And... They at just one point were talking about how rich they were and they felt they could do anything. And they sure enough, they were in this game. They were just throwing money at any problem. In fact, one part they did a line, it was very eerie to things today, where he basically like pretends to just shoot a guy right. and then pays him to clean it up and nobody does anything. Or another, they're yelling and screaming and just ignoring these these two other players who are playing the women. And I hilariously, one, one of them was, well, not hilariously, but one of them was even a man that did it and it was interesting. Right. And came afterwards were, feel how did you feel doing that? And it was interesting to hear them say, you know, I felt disgusted with myself but i realize this now right and right well that's that is what Dan, we talk about we tell students over and over again and i have been told when i was a student over and over again literature is cathartic literature you know reveals literature there is truth in there and you know the students are like oh yeah right you know tell me another one you know let me let me out of here how many words in the essay you know let me go let me go look up something that i can paraphrase um and the but for them to experience that, which, by the way, oh, Keenan, by the way, why do we claim that only these high and awful works of genius in literature can prompt that when any of us can do it together with this very activity? Maybe the sequestering of the literary creative process into one person's head in private is not actually an intrinsic function of or an intrinsic component of work of this caliber. Exactly. To unpack that, could you say that in a way that <laughs> that is yes. Uh, yes, want, yes, yes, yes. Uh, let's let's there's several thoughts in there. I'm going with the student that you just described, right? The one who said I was disgusted, but now I know. You know, I have discovered you basically we're talking about value systems, aren't we? The student discovered aspects of his value system. We can talk about value systems all day long, right? But no, this is where you, you get it. Now, let's turn to the uh, a, a common way of implied way of looking at works of literature and narrative media in general. And I think it's fair to say that ones that do that for a viewer, a reader, whatever, are praised as such. The work is powerful. The work speaks to the human condition. The work is dark. The work is, you know, I, I love to say, you know, the best novel in, that I have ever read concerns, you know, a father and his oldest son having, an affair, each having, you know, romantic interaction with the same woman and uh, then the father's and the father, who's this rather wretched old person, you know, ends up with his head bashed in. And, uh, you know, the whole thing is just really sorted beyond belief. And the student and, and it's the brothers Karamazov, of course. And um, so, yes, I mean, you have these these kind of vile aspects of ourselves that are experienced and you're 
fleetingly identifying with them and recognizing things about yourself and what you do and don't, you know, know about yourself, what you do and don't think about yourself. We praise these works. We say this is where it's not, you know, some people would say, oh, that's where it's not mere entertainment. I don't use that distinction personally, but the, uh, but things like that, these works are praised. Now, do we as a culture acknowledge that the capacity to make stories like that is an ordinary human capability or do we present it or assume that only a particularly special person can produce work of that sort the person must be a genius sure. or they must be psychologically disturbed or they must be you know have have contact with god you know in in their contact with the metaphysic of ethics or something. Do you see what I mean? That question. Yes, I do. To answer that question, uh, one thing we love in our district uh, and everything I do is uh, we acknowledge that anybody can do anything with their writing. And that's a belief right. I have right. in creativity. Uh, actually, I love is, I call it fail faster. It's the mindset, the growth mindset. Oh, yeah. And yeah. in the gro growth mindset theory by Carol Dweck, we always say, you know, nothing actually started out great. It becomes this way. Mm -hmm. And so especially in writing, we even could look at an author and say, you know, these ideas, no matter how impactful, emotional, it probably didn't start that way. It had to grow into it. Oh, sure. So it's fascinating that you mentioned that, that, that we do encourage that with students, that anything can be that way. And I actually think you're right. One of the things that I do love about role playing with them in these games is they do get these aspects of themselves that maybe push them to uncomfortable places, but right. they can explore those places right. with permission, which yeah, is why I do right. love everything you mentioned about lines and veils. It's all about permission. Right. And if they feel they have permission to explore that, they can understand it better. And you know what? I personally, I think a lot of people do agree that if we can understand how maybe things that are uncomfortable to us are and get a get a safe space, we always talk about safe spaces, to that, we can understand right. things better. It's like, yeah, is, the the safe is the safe space where you can't do something or is it a safe space where you can? That's a very, always very believe. good question. And I always believe when I talk about safe spaces, it is a place where we can do things. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I, and it, it comes from, I used to be a debate coach even. And as a debate coach, you would have to defend views that you might not agree with because you were on the pro or the con side of an mm -hmm. argument that you might not be part of. But it, because you had to learn, I always told people, I said, you know, the best way you can learn about something that even you might hate is to actually defend it. Because that's that's a very positive view. It, yeah, that's a very positive view. That's the the negative side, of course, is that then you become glib, you know, a sophist. But that's that's I, I know that's not where you're going. I'm just being a pain. Um, when you mentioned yeah. that, yeah, no, I think it's one of the best parts about role playing. I mean, when they go to those scenes, they're the best scenes. I agree. Because, mm -hmm. it, as I said, the Great Gatsby, they felt disgusted. They mm -hmm. felt. They felt like monsters. Mm -hmm. And yet I said, well, why did you do it? And they said, because I could. That's right. Yeah, there's a but lot going on there, isn't there? There was a lot going on there that we talked about. Then we got into politics of what it means to be mm -hmm. filthy rich. Mm -hmm. And can money change your personality? And yes, all these things came out of that. Uh, and it was so great. But, you know, it all it all became because they had they knew it was a safe space. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, maybe that might be what we want to call this episode. I originally was going to call it Lines and Veils, but well, it's it might very be interesting. Calling... It's there's the, the you know, there's a book by Graham Walmsley called Play Unsafe, where he's talking about not necessarily Lines and Veils, but about jumping into the unknown in terms of what's going to happen, which is something I had mentioned earlier, too. And so it's very interesting calling this episode safe space is really an interesting choice because in many venues or too many audience members, perhaps in my experience, they would instantly assume that it would be all about the shutdown of things and the lack of permission, the, the withdrawal of permission, less permission. And so the, well, maybe that's the thing I want to teach teachers right, right now and everybody right. who's listening to this is, when using these things, it is never to shut things down. It is to open things up. Right. Because right. role-playing is about experiencing. Mm -hmm. And it is about 
in immersing yourself. That's why when I have my other group, I call it immersive imaginative education. Right. It was the original group I made, but it was all about immersing ourselves in things. And to immerse yourself in something, you got to get uncomfortable a little bit. You will, right. but as long as it's a safe space to get uncomfortable and knowing that if it ever feels too uncomfortable, we respect that. Uh, is, is the way I do believe that that things are. Uh, I that's how I, at least I I advocate it, and I hope those listening will from this conversation gain that 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 can really create great and powerful students. Uh, I, I agree with you, and I, I I actually am extremely thrilled. I really wish that this kind of thing. You realize, of course, that when I was in college that to talk even about science fiction, horror, and most particularly comics, as if they were even discussable in literary terms or in terms of value to the practitioners and to the, the, the viewers and readers, was absolutely, absolutely out of the question. This would have been in the mid-80s, the early and mid-80s, and you did not, by any means, at all talk about that stuff in a literary or critical context it was not worthy and, and you read the book at that time great gatsby this is all the book I you read at it. that time the right. scarlet letter i mean right. that's why i do this thing right. because if you read these novels this right. type of stuff is everywhere well that's that that's why i always talk the about novel, the, the novel. that's why i always talk about Fyodor, the, the the brothers Fyodor dostoevsky and the, the brothers karamazov which is that um, you know, this is an incredibly sordid story, and it is not a sordid story for no reason, you know, that it is, um, and the, and, and all of you are talking about, oh, well, it speaks to the higher planes of the human spirit, and I'm like, are you kidding? Are you really kidding me? Um, and so it is, uh, but I was talking more about genre content, which was a very, which was a derogatory term at the time. Um, you know, you can't, that, that doesn't count. That's genre was the, would be the response. Um, and so it was a matter of, it's a matter of some relief and joy that I hear talking about these role-playing techniques, this hobby activity, this fringe activity, actually being recognized for what it is and can do. Um, and so, yes, that's very important to me. In the game Over the Edge, published in, I, I always get this mixed up, 1991 and 1992, um, maybe 92. Uh, the game is by Jonathan Tweet, but it includes an essay in it by Robin Laws. And it ends with a great line, which is, it's not every day that you get to be in on the ground floor of an emerging art form. And, uh, and I think he was right. So it's... It's nice to see, you know, that the cycle is not, you know, that that I lived to see it. It doesn't have to go three or four more generations before people are looking at games like I Hope Sorcerer and saying, you know, this actually has, this actually packs a punch. Um, so I say this for right now, your game Sorcerer, <laughs> it does. I've been wanting to run it. I have never had a group I could run it with, mainly because by the time I read your book, I now have a two-year-old and a six-year-old. Uh -huh. So. It's been hard to run a game like Sorcerer with them around. Right. Um, but I would say for those of you who are in the audience in education or who haven't done games, really do check out some of Ron Edwards' games because, you. welcome, because what I like to do with games, to give an example, is I take out the aspects of them that encourage these safe spaces, um, that encourage these talks and conversations. So when I do things like Great Gatsby or these other ones, I use the microscope system for scene making because it has a great thing at the beginning of every scene where everybody gets to say what they're thinking at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great when everybody knows that everybody's thinking because then they all get the idea of, okay, this is where we're going to go with it. And it makes it easier to go there. And and if you want to see a great system, I will say to the audience there, of getting mechanics that you want to use that can get really people to open up and talk discussions, uh, Sorcerer is a great start for a system that does that because it talks all about power struggles. And one of the things I really appreciated it is it talks about having to deal with the internal struggles of the kind of demons inside you because it's called Sorcerer and they're actual demons. But um, if we didn't, if we even took all that out, it really is about in its core a little bit, or at least I think it is. And you're welcome to counter mm -hmm. me. 
oh, how well, do we handle oh, sorry, the ahead. voices in our head that are like the devils on your shoulders and how do we handle them? And when they're played by other people, it's a very powerful aspect of how to understand ourselves. And, you know, as a, as I always think role-playing is a great as a cathartic experience to understand things. Uh, if you're ever reading a novel where there is a character who has that moral compass inside, getting that moral compass played by someone else at the table and having them push against you, it's such a great way to have um, interactions. And I do the microscope scene. Some will just play the, the they've actually played the devil on the shoulder of somebody. Yeah. And it's a great, yeah. it credit, is a great credit to should go to the first version of Wraith a white wolf game in the mid nineties, uh, which I actually think was the, in my opinion, was the best of their early games. Um, but it also was the one that got the least traction. Um, but it featured, it featured a, a play technique that was similar to what you're talking about. Source were to go to one of your points about it. What, the way I like to put it is if you played it without any fictional component to the demons, you still could that the, uh, the game is about relationships, particularly dysfunctional relationships, and the disturbing fact that dysfunctional relationships are not just simplistic morality tales in which they will always come to grief. There is a treacherous power in them. Sometimes transcending them is good. Sometimes there's other kinds of outcomes. So yes, yes, it, it is not a game about fictional demons because I think fictional demons are cool to draw. You know, it's, it's exactly, a no, game. What, what I love about, what I do love about games and your games is it was so much of a start of so many different games. And, you know, I, I, I would love to go into the history of the forge and everything and what mm -hmm. happened there, but this is an education podcast for education. Right. We will continue. Folks. Yeah. We, something tells me we'll have a few more conversations as the years go by. But the um, the the thing but I do want to just say right here, yeah. uh, and sorry, uh, what you are right, uh, Ron, is games is to really invoke the human spirit and invoke sides of ourselves and feel different ways to experience things. Because what I always say is, you know, when we're playing these games about stories, or you're making your own story act ways, but you're going to feel uncomfortable doing it a little bit. But we want that because. You want to, you have a chance to feel as something you aren't, and let me at least go one step further that I think is reinforcing your point. And here I'm going to be quoting a participant at the Forge and a role playing creator, other an other creative person in his own right for sure, who's Christopher Kubasik, and he uh, said that what we're really talking about is very simply and easily understood by considering the popular game of Twister. that Twister played among adults or people, you know, who aren't just kids is just got a little bit of, it. you can call it a discomfort if you want to. You could call it transgression if you want to. You could call it flirting if you want to, although I don't think it ever really is flirting. Um, but the notion that you are contorting your body around with other people that, and perhaps coming into contact, not particularly sexually, but coming into contact with them in ways that you simply would not do in the course of daily events. And you're doing this voluntarily. And frankly, I don't think any group of people ever played Twister without kind of being into that a little bit today. And I think that's kind of the part that of this, which is very important, is the notion of lines as powerful items, that we can avoid lines, and there is perfectly good reasons to avoid lines, um, when and if that's what we want to do, and which lines they are. But then there are lines which are to be played with, Rather than avoided, no, we are playing, it's based, huh, the analogies get kind of ridiculous, but just imagine a person in, in many games with a boundary, you know, soccer, football, et cetera, basketball, that working the line of that boundary as part of your play tactics in a competitive sense is very, very important. 
a, a team that works those lines, you know, jumps out of bounds, but passes the ball before they touch ground, that kind of thing, you know, jumps out of bounds so they can't be blocked and shoots in the air and then comes down, you know, which is legal. All of those things will definitely be better play than the team which plays entirely within the lines. Now, again, the analogy of purpose breaks down entirely. We're not talking about competition and beating another team. We are, however, talking about the, the use of boundaries in different ways. And, um, and I think that's what this whole talk has been about. And I really, really appreciate your kind words, not just you know the complimentary ones about the work, but also your acknowledgement that playing with the lines is not just in and of itself some sort of bad thing that people with no boundaries do. Yeah, you know, I, I think that is the perfect spot to end this conversation. Uh, and by the way, I, I, it's so funny. I originally wanted like a 30 minute one, but I'm so happy <laughs> we went so long with this thing. Well, I really um, appreciate it, yeah. My pleasure, but I do wanna say you are right. That is the place to end this. For all you educators out there, for all you fledgling gamers that are even listening to this, uh, if you play with the boundaries respectfully for everybody, if you work it to make a safe space for people, and as we've defined here, what me and Ron kind of agree with a safe space is a space where have the ability to be open to play, to really go there. Powerful experience for people. And for so many of you, I really do encourage you to try this with your students. Uh, not, not by the way, when you say boundaries, understand, we understand the limits of age and everything. We're not yep. saying go certain. Well, that's why we're I talking about time. these people, right? When you play, you're playing with this particular batch of people and that's all you're playing. That's all the only people you're playing with. You aren't playing with some abstracted notion of the player or the group. Play be there because it can be so productive for those four C's of education, especially of communication and yeah. And it'll get aspects and it'll help them understand themselves better, which just from a psychological perspective is a great thing to be able to do. It's a healthy thing if done correctly. Thank you, Ron. I might have to have you on again sometime. Uh -huh. <laughs> thank you, Ron, for coming on my show. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, this was a wonderful conversation about there when I started, but making a safe space, safe space for gaming. Thank you so and much, Keenan. you done to help make that happen. Take care.